Hi everyone, this is the second lecture of week nine. And again, a reminder to keep up with your readings from the biblical text and from Coogan as terms and questions from the biblical text and from Coogan. They will show up on your quizzes, even though I will not talk about them on the video. Okay. Um, last time we looked at one of the first judges uh, mentioned in the book of Judges, Ehud. In this video, we're going to look at the next judge who follows on the heels of Ehud's judgeship. Okay, and as with um, every other judge, with, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, with uh, this next kind of judge, um, so as we saw with Ehud, you're going to again see this emphasis on sexuality, violence, and the body. Okay, so this pattern again, okay, things are fine when Ehud is alive, however, Ehud dies, okay, at which point the Israelites sin, as a result, they are oppressed by their enemies. And this time, uh, the oppressor is this Canaanite king who has an army general named Sisera. So keep that in mind, okay? So they're oppressed. Then the Israelites repent and they cry out to God, at which point God raises them another judge, in this case, Deborah. And this is how Deborah is described in Judges 4, verse 4 and following. At that time, Deborah, whose name means bee or queen bee, a prophetess, wife of Lapidot, okay, was judging Israel. Okay, this is verse four, uh, Judges four, verse four. This is, um, again, slightly the wrong translation, okay? It should read instead, at that time, uh, Deborah, a bee or queen bee, a prophetess, uh, not a wife of Lapidot. This is, I think they're trying to minimize who she is here. Literally, it says a woman of torches, or flame, or a fiery woman, okay, because lapidot means torches, okay, was judging Israel, okay, so notice uh, what your translators are doing, okay, going onwards, um, she used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel, in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came to her for judgment, she sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinoam from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. And Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she, and she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. And then Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh. Okay. Um, again, the Hebrew is a lot richer than what it, what it says. So, uh, you know, aside from how Deborah is described, which I think is flattened, okay, um, notice that she's described in a very particular way, a kind of flaming, a woman of torches. She's a kind of bee, right? Um, she used to notice where she's located. She sits under the palm of Deborah. Notice these religiously tinged trees, right? And I think I mentioned in the preceding video um, that trees were not necessarily just trees, that they were seen as perhaps animated somehow, maybe filled with the spirit, somewhat holy, okay? Um, so she's sitting under a recognizable tree, right? Which is very interesting because she is, what, a female cultic figure, Right, and um, one of the well-known goddesses of the ancient uh, ancient Canaan, um, Asherah, was imagined as a tree or, or associated with the tree or tree of life. So it's it's very interesting that this cultic female, uh, one you know, religious professional is sitting under a particular tree. Okay, um, not just a tree, but where this tree is located, this tree or palm of Deborah is located, is very interesting. We're told that it sits between Rama which means literally a high place. The high place this is a very famous cultic site, okay, between Rama and Bethel. Bethel means Beit uh, El, or the house of God, another extremely famous cultic site. So notice everything is pointing to how um, holy she is, I guess, okay, or how religiously tinged she is, okay. And I, and I do think that the way that the translator um, translates this, dumbs that down, or mutes that, right? Because as if the modern translator is uncomfortable with a woman with this much religious power and conveying to the reader how much religious power a woman had, okay? So I think there is a kind of political move here, okay? So this woman, we are told, summons Barack. Barack, um, this is the same word, I believe, as Barack Obama, but um, the, this name means, um, it doesn't mean blessing because there's a slight change in 
spelling. This means lightning. So notice all the kind of flaming imagery. Okay. Um, so what you get is Deborah, well-known prophetess, right, uh, who is like a queen bee managing her hive, right, who's trying to, who is commanded by God to get her kind of like stinging bees ready to fight, right, and so the kind of hive is inflamed, right, and this, this may explain the kind of um, lightning fire image. Of course, Yahweh himself is associated with fire or lightning or thunder, so maybe that's also at work here. Okay. Um, despite being named Barak or Lightning, however, we are told that Barak demurs when he is commanded by Deborah or commanded by Yahweh, you know, through Deborah to go fight the enemy and says to her, well, you know, I'm not going to go if you don't come along too. Okay. Um, and, 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 and Deborah says, well, fine, fine, fine. Right. Um, I will go, but you know, you're not going to win the honor for this fight. Instead, it will go to a woman. Okay. And of course the narrative is kind of setting up for the fact that it's going to be Deborah who's going to get this kind of glory for the fight, but then it does this kind of surprise ending. Okay. Um, we are told that, um, and I'm condensing what is very rich, story, right, so that I can talk about it really quickly. We are told that Barak and his army, uh, they're successful so much so that the enemy, uh, that the general of the enemy army, Sisera, he has to flee on foot, okay, and he flees on foot until he ends up at the tent of this woman called Yael, okay, who uh, seems to be married to an ally of Sisera. Now, Yael's name, interestingly, means Yah, okay, or Yahweh, okay, El, God, uh, her name means Yahweh is God, so think about, um, already the text is telling you how things will go for Sisera, who will end up in the tent of Yael, Yahweh is God, not well, okay, so this is what happens in uh, chapter 4, verse 18 and following, Yael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, have no fear, so he turned aside to her into the tent and she covered him with a little rug. And he said to her, please give me a little water to drink for I am thirsty. So she opened the skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him or tucked him in. And he said to her, stand at the entrance of the tent. And if anybody comes and asks, is anyone there? Say no. But Yael, wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground. He was lying fast asleep from weariness and he died. Then as Barak came in pursuit of Sisera, Yael went out to meet him and said to her, come and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent and there was Sisera lying dead with a tent peg in his temple, right? So this, um, again, notice how the story does this kind of surprise, extremely violent ending at the end, okay? Notice also the various portrayals of Yael, who like Deborah, okay? Um, the kind of, you know, female prophetess, right? Is imagined as a kind of, you know, not atypical, right? They're kind of these outsider warriors, Okay, Yael is an outsider insofar as she is married to seemingly an ally of the enemy, right? She is also an outsider in that women don't usually drive tent pegs into male men's heads, okay? So um, um, notice that Deborah is also an outsider. She is a woman, but she's a prophetess, an extremely important religious figure. Remember Ehud? He's also an outsider. Why? Because he's bound or left-handed or something like that, okay? Um, Aside from an outsider, Yael is also portrayed as a kind of seductress, a woman kind of waiting or standing at the door of her tent, urging um, a man to come in and be seduced, okay? And this image, especially of a foreign woman or a temptress beckoning passersby, this will be used by the writers of Proverbs as a kind of ultimate symbol of temptation, right? An ultimate symbol of the lack of wisdom, okay? Once inside the tent, um, notice that Yael's portrayal or the way that she's imagined keeps shifting. Okay, so once inside the tent, so outside the tent, she is a seductress. Inside the tent, right, she's portrayed at once as this kind of comforting, cooing mommy figure who gives Cicero some milk and tucks him in and tells him to rest, you know. And finally, at the end, right, notice, um, again, another shift, right? Now she's this kind of woman warrior 
maybe even a kind of rapist, as she's depicted as emasculating Sisera by driving a tent peg through his head. Okay. And so notice the kind of rape-like imagery. Okay. Indeed, it is no coincidence that we get so many images, so many images of rape, okay, um, especially associated with war. Um, of course, rape, uh, sorry, war was frequently entailed rape of lots of women, right? Um, also, of course, war itself was imagined as a kind of overpowering, raping or feminizing of the enemy, right? So uh, war is imagined as, you know, an army forcibly entering a town and doing violence upon it. So it's not surprising that war and rape imagery would go together, okay, or sexual imagery. Um, this kind of last image uh, of Ya'el as a rapist, uh, a kind of you know, reverse almost, uh, or someone who sexually takes or overpowers her enemy, uh, you know, uh, comes out most vividly, vividly, not in Judges 4, but in Judges 5, right, which is this old poem um, uh, that offers a kind of slightly difficult to understand poetic version of the story in Judges 4. Okay. And I'm going to, again, give you the NRSV translation and then try to give you the more correct translation. Okay. So this is how um, Judges 5 describes what happens in Judges 4. Okay. So 5, verse 24 and following. Most blessed of women be Yael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite of ten dwelling women most blessed. He asked water and she gave him milk. She brought him curds in a lordly cup. Okay. She put her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the, worker, the workman's mallet. And she struck Sisera a blow. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. He sank. He fell. He lay still at her feet. At her feet, he sank. He fell. Where he sank, there he fell dead. Okay. And remember, feet is, again, another code word for the genitalia. Okay, this last line, um, there's a different translation offered by Susan Neidich, which I think is actually slightly more accurately captures what's going on. Okay, so this is an alternative translation of verse 5, uh, Judges 5, verse 27. Between her legs he knelt, he fell, he lay. Between her legs he knelt, he fell. Where he knelt, there he fell, despoiled. Okay, and in this translation, she really brings out, I think, the sexual kind of undertones that are there in the text. Okay, so notice, um, again, I'm going very fast with a very complicated text, but notice the amazingly complicated portrayals of women or very uh, portrayals of women in this story as a prophet, a military leader, seductress, woman warrior, mother, rapist. Okay, um, there's actually a final image we find, again, in the poem in Judges 5, okay? For some reason, in a pretty uncomfortable move, okay, the author of Judges 5 turns at the very end of his poem to describe and humanize the enemy by looking at what is going on with Sisera's mother while all this is happening, okay? And this is what it says in Judges 5, 28 and following. Out of the window she peered, the mother of Sisera gazed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long and coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? Her wisest ladies make answer. Indeed, she answers the question herself. Are they not finding and dividing the spoil, a girl or two for every man, spoil of dyed stuff for Sisera, spoil of dyed stuff embroidered, two pieces of dyed work embroidered for my neck as spoil. Okay. Notice here a final vision of women. Right. Um, as a, you know, it describes how a mother, right, this final vision of women is of a mother or a family member worrying at home, wondering whether their son or brother or father now, whether they'll come home um, alive, right, uh, because they've gone to battle. And, and through this portrayal, notice how the writer weirdly humanizes the enemy, right, makes them, you know, it's odd that at the end, you get a sense into how his mom is doing, right? While, of course, you, the reader, know that he's dead, right? So this kind of switching of vision is very weird, okay? Um, and it humanizes her or humanizes Sisera and certainly his mother until, again, at the very end where it kind of turns, okay? At which point we get another vision of women as victims of war and of rape. 
notice that Cicero's mother's friends, they comfort her, right? Um, by saying, oh, he's just late because he is dividing up the spoils of war, right? Um, and what does the spoils of war include? Well, they include girls or women who will likely end up being enslaved, raped, mistreated, Okay, so at the very end, it goes all the way around and, of course, ends up with, right, um, going from kind of a woman as a rapist to women who are raped. Okay, um, Judges 4 and 5 is remarkable in that it showcase, showcases the various roles, functions, meaning women had in society, portraying them not as a monolith, monolith but as a varied and incredibly complicated group. Okay. And it's all the more remarkable considering that these writers were all probably men. Okay. Indeed, this portrayal is so amazing coming out of male writers that some scholars have even wondered whether this reflected reality in some way. Maybe that's why they were able to do such a rich portrayal. Okay. Um, they wonder whether in the period of judges, before the administration and the government becomes kind of codified and solidified, whether this period actually did allow women Okay, more opportunities for women, such as Deborah. Okay, um, uh, you know, space to take on a variety of roles, the variety of roles that they would later be kicked out from once the administration kind of solidified. Okay, who knows, right? What is clear is that for some reason, this book, Judges, is chock full of these fascinating stories, right? Um, usually sexual, very violent, right? Filled with these oddball characters. Okay. Uh, again, for more on the stories uh, from judges, please turn to the next video.